Hi, my name is Ben Martins and I'm one of the application specialists here at Pico Technology in the UK. And today we are going to be taking a look at one of our guest case studies. Um, now, all of these case studies are available on our website, www.picoauto.com, and navigate to the sort of content hub knowledge base area, and all of our case studies are there. However, we thought we'd bring this one together to life and just go through it all together on video. Right, so we'll get started. This particular machine um, was a self-propelled crop sprayer, easy for me to say. Um, now, the symptoms for this particular machine were a very slow and hard to start. Um, so when you come to crank it, it would take a while to crank over and it'll be slow and sluggish and then eventually it would start. And this has been progressively getting worse. Um, now obviously all the information comes from the customer. So as we always say, the customer has the answers even if they don't. Um, so yeah, so your diagnostic method. First thing to stick with, your diagnostic process. Yeah. So customer interview, verify the fault and then confirm the rectification afterwards. Um, two key points there that often get overlooked, the interview and the rectification. Having the before and after proves and gives you the evidence to show what you've done. Okay, so, customer's gone through, obviously given us the information about the, the complaint. Next step, what do we need? The information we need to get. So we want as much information about the machine and the vehicle as possible. We want access to wiring diagrams where available and obviously component location. For something like a crop sprayer, um, especially a self-propelled one, obviously the location for certain components is going to be very different from that within, say, a tractor or a combine harvester. So location information is important. Obviously, we want to collect as much evidence as possible once we've verified the fault. Scan tool data, remember Picoscope is not a replacement for your scan tool. It's there to help enhance that data that you get from it. Okay, if your scan tool doesn't give you any fault codes, then where do you start? Well, that's when obviously the scope can give you some real data to start working with. Visual inspection, again, something that's often overlooked. More often than not, sometimes it might just be that a cable's loose, a grounding strap's loose, you know, things like that. You know, in this particular situation where we have a slow cranking speed, yep, all the grounding points are going to be really important. We need to check and make sure that they are all okay. Then obviously, once we've gone through all of those, then we're gonna to have to be looking and thinking, how can we apply peak scope in the most non-intrusive way as possible, okay? So, obviously as I said, this is a guest case study from one of our customers in North America. They very kindly shared it with us, and obviously I'm just bringing that information to life. So, initial troubleshooting came from an on-site technician and they had been through a number of different things to try and rectify this. They started focusing mainly on the fuel side of the system. Right or wrong, who knows, maybe there was an action plan in place that actually sent him down that route. However, some components had already been replaced and the fault had still persisted. So at what point do you start going, we need to make some measurements before we replace any more components? So if we just focus on the actual fuel system itself to begin with. So during cranking, we have on channel A, we have our rail pressure sensor. Channel B is our inlet metering valve or fuel quantitative control valve or whatever anybody else wants to call it. There's various different names for them. Channel C is our camshaft position sensor and that is an inductive sensor. And on channel D is our crankshaft sensor. So out of all of those, they are vital bits of information or vital sensors that are required in order to actually inject fuel into this engine in order to help it start. So if we look through those signals, well, the rail pressure, there's definitely a change. We can see during the cranking stages that fuel pressure does come up. Okay, good, happy days. The inlet metering valve, that is a solenoid controlled actuator and it's controlled via positive or negative duty cycle, so PWM. Now, there is a PWM signal there. The voltages all look like they're in spec. So we could safely say the signal was getting to the controller, all right, current might have been useful here to verify that work is being done. But from here, we can see from the control side that something is being requested to be driven. Channel C, our camshaft sensor, again, is inductive. All right, it's not quite ideal in the sense that there is a bit of movement on that signal. 
However, we definitely have a pulse, and on this particular machine, there'll be a double pulse, and then followed by individual ones, and they will relate to the different cylinders. Finally, on channel D is our crankshaft position sensor. And again, we have an inductive output. In a real world situation, if you wanted to be 100% verified for that sensor, you'd want to measure both sides and then do the differential across it to give you and reveal the full amplitude of that signal itself for the crankshaft sensor, okay? In this situation, we can see it's working, we have a signal, happy days, okay? So from the fuel side, all looks okay. So where would we go next? Well, we didn't have any fault codes. Fuel side looks good. We need to step back slightly. So timing could possibly be another issue for a prolonged crank, yeah? Now on a lot of agricultural machinery, they are gear-driven engines. It's very unlikely if the engine has been never taken apart or has never had any work done, the timing is ever gonna be out. Could have been out from when the engine was first made, of course, um, but we would expect that symptom to have been there since the start of delivery of the vehicle or the machine. So, not to be overlooked, again, we go in and we do our cam and crank position test. Now, we've obviously got cam and crank from the fuel pressure sensor, so um, test before. All this is doing now is giving ourselves a bit more time and then obviously comparing signals to a known good. So, reference waveform library, obviously important. If you haven't got a signal there, maybe speak to some neighboring dealerships to see if they have a similar vehicle that they could get a potential capture from. Or if you're on site and you're lucky enough to have the same engine fitted to maybe a different machine, then obviously the signals are likely to be the same. So again, look around if you Known good data is obviously vitally important. Now on this particular capture, what we've done was we've actually included both the known good and the live capture. So we can see from the top screen, they have been two reference waveforms we pulled into our capture. And then using the two different viewports, we can then split those up and we can see them individually. There's loads of information about viewports and reference waveforms on our website, so do go there to check it out. In terms of the actual measurement, how do we determine whether or not it's good or bad, or timing is in or out? Well, we need to make some measurements, of course, and then do the comparison between the two. An easy way to do that is to use phase rulers. Phase rulers um, will give you a boundary where you mark out zero to 720 degrees, or zero to 360, depending on how you want to work. And then from there, that boundary, we then use a time ruler to position and mark up somewhere that we can reference the two signals together, yeah? So from there, we will get the measurement in both time, but more importantly, in degrees as well. Why is that important? The one thing that could be different between captures is the engine speed. If the engine speed is different, it means our time measurement could also be different, so we couldn't rely on it to compare two different waveforms if they're at two different engine speeds. Okay, the other way to do it would just be to count the number of teeth. Yeah, it might just be as easy to say, well, I've got 12 teeth, that 12 teeth is gonna be the same 12 teeth, dependent, irrespective of the actual engine speed. Yeah, so phase rulers or count the teeth to get your, your comparison between two different signals or two different engines. We can clearly see here though that our degree marker on our known good is 64.98 degrees and on our live capture we have 64.8 degrees. I think we can safely say the timing is fine. So coming back full circle, and you could argue maybe a relative compression test should have been one of the first things you do. Could be, depends on how you're working and the type of process and action plan that you've come up with to begin with. I really like to do relative compression first. Not only does it give you a little bit of information, it's so simple, it's a current clamp around the starter motor cable, just prevent the engine from starting and crank it over and see what you've got. Made it even easier now if you have a BNC plus current clamp because you haven't got to worry about the batteries being flat. Now when we did this test, we can clearly see that there is a difference. So if we zoom in around this, I've also added in a known good capture at the top, so again, when we were getting our known good data, you know, make the capture in the same way that you might apply to your faulty machine. Yeah, in this situation, I have my 
camshaft, crankshaft, and my starter motor current. Now, if we compare just the current between the two, we can clearly see that there is a big difference. Now, what I've done is I've highlighted using two time rulers an area and um, used that area between the rulers to make the measurement, to give me the average. And we can see the average of our good capture is about 400 amps, and our average in our live capture, our faulty machine, 774. It's almost double the amount of current. We can also see that we've set the time rulers up to be two seconds of time between each one. We can see there that there obviously we have our extended crank on our faulty machine. So we could argue, well, there's two bits of data there that are really useful. We've verified the complaint. And we've also given us some direction as to what the fault could be. So coming down to thinking about, right, what is going to cause my starter motor to pull more current than what it should be doing? Well, a number of different things. We could start thinking about, you know, real engine mechanical issues, such as a partially seized engine even. Um, we could say the starter motor might be slightly worn. We could have one of the cables that's actually slightly disconnected or there's a high amount of corrosion on it causing a higher current pull. So all of those in turn can be sort of pointing towards a problem. Now, this particular machine though, this is where product knowledge is really important. We need to know how the machine should work. For a lot of agricultural and off-highway machinery, the engine is purely used to drive a hydraulic pump or hydraulic pumps, yeah? So for variable displacement pumps, hydraulic pumps, they will always start up in a maximum displacement. So that means it's trying to push out the maximum amount of flow rate when you're cranking the engine. Yeah, it seems slightly counterintuitive. For this particular machine, they had a special solenoid which helped unload or destroke the hydraulic pump so it wasn't on maximum load during startup. Now, if we think about the machine on this particular machine, the hydraulic pumps drive the hydrostatic transmission as well as all the other components and obviously the boom arms and everything like that. So if there's a lot of demand on the hydraulic system during startup. If you can take that demand away by reducing the amount of stroke or the amount of um, displacement that the pump starts up on, you're effectively relieving the, en the engine of that extra load. Now what the customer found here was that actually the solenoid control, the wiring, the solenoid was working fine. So they did obviously a, just a bench test, just livened it up, checked the resistance, that was all fine. So the only thing left really then is wiring. Now if anybody's ever worked on a self-propelled crop sprayer, the wires are everywhere. The short term fix here was to actually just overlay a wiring harness and actually just piggyback onto it and just connect up directly between either end and that fixed it, yeah, that was the fault. It was obviously a wiring issue somewhere in the loom um, that was causing the problem. So ultimately a replacement harness would be needed, but obviously, again, if you ever worked in the agricultural industry, time is money and farmers don't wait for anyone. So <laughs> they want their machine fixed quickly as possible. Hence why a temporary fix or an overlay of the harness was added in and the fault was cured, so all good. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a brief insight. That case study in full is obviously on our website. All of the waveform captures are actually also on the waveform library. So if you want to see any of those, do make sure you go and check them out. Um, but as always, thanks for watching. I hope it helped and we'll see you soon.